Ellen Grant is the granddaughter of Harry and Annie Judd, one of the pioneering couples who settled in Brackendale in the late 19th century and raised their family on a homestead that still stands today as a testimony to their lasting legacy. Dorothy Judd, Harry and Annie's youngest child, was Ellen's mother, and Ellen spent part of her childhood in the big yellow farmhouse on Judd Road. Ellen attributes her own success in life to her grandparents, who passed their values of self-sufficiency and hard work onto their children and grandchildren. She says Harry gave her roots, and Annie Judd provided the wings. When my grandmother came up to Squamish for the first time, she came as a guest of the Roses, and the Roses were managers for one of the hop branches here. Um, my grandmother here is on the right, and Mrs. Rose is on the left. They took a hike up the mountain to a little lake and if you can imagine hiking up to Alice Lake in uh, high-heeled boots and long dresses uh, in uh, on a very narrow trail this is the picture and they look like they had just stepped out of the parlor uh, Alice Lake is named after Mrs. Rose my grandmother uh, later brought her children up to the lake for summer holidays. They would spend oh, a week to ten days, depending on the weather, fishing and camping and playing games and having a really good time. Annie Edwards, the future wife of Harry Judd, arrived in Squamish in 1894 aboard the Burt, a steamer that regularly plied the waters of Howe Sound. Two of her fellow passengers on that voyage were Alan and Catherine Ray. They had settled in Brackendale in 1888, and that year their son Edgar, the first non-native child, was born in the Squamish Valley. The Rays would eventually have ten children, eight sons and two daughters. Alan Ray is the bearded man holding a box, and behind him is his mother-in-law, Mrs. Alec Robertson. She and her husband were the first non-native settlers in the Squamish Valley. To her left is her daughter, Catherine Ray, and in front is her granddaughter, Retta. In the fall of 1889, 19-year-old Harry Judd, who was a surveyor, arrived in Brackendale and built a log cabin. Shortly after that, his parents and brother and sister from London, Ontario, arrived to join him. On Boxing Day, 1894, he married Annie Edwards at Annie's parents' house in Vancouver. In 1894, there were no roads or rail links to any of the communities along House Sound. So shortly after they were married, Harry and Annie Judd took a passenger vessel to Squamish and then traveled by horse and buggy to the site of their homestead where they started a long and prosperous life as a married couple. John Bracken was the owner of the first store in Brackendale and it is said that he was the person who named the post office since that's where the uh, post office was, was a j part of the store. However, the story that I have been told is that some people were reluctant to accept that name for their small community and so during a discussion they decided that maybe the bracken was named after the bracken fern that uh, grew quite abundantly, particularly in the northern part of Brackendale. So 
with the two reasons for naming it Brackendale, with the Dale added on to Bracken's name, it was quite acceptable to everyone in the community. Myrtle Judd encountered her first trip out of the valley in 1909, when she journeyed to Vancouver with her parents, Harry and Annie Judd. They traveled to the dock from their home in Brackendale in a horse-drawn buggy, and she recalled that the government wharf where the Britannia was moored was so narrow that she was terrified they would all go over into the deep water. The ship had a full English-style dining room, with real linen tablecloths, real silver, and waiters with towels over their arms. When she and her parents got to Vancouver, they walked three blocks to Hastings Street to board a streetcar, which clanked off to Georgia Street. For Myrtle, the experience was the thrill of a lifetime. of former days they call me a bummer and a gin sought too but what cares i for praise for my heart is filled with the days of yore oft i do repine for the days of old the days of gold the days of 49 By 1912, there were about 300 people living in the Squamish Valley. Agriculture and animal husbandry were still the mainstay of the economy, but logging was gradually gaining a foothold. The Yap Timber Company was operating in the Chequamus area, and two brothers, Allen and Charles Barber, began logging in Brackendale, using one of the new steam donkeys to haul logs. Unfortunately, they lost the contraption in a poker game but their logging operation continued with considerable success. Charles Schoonover was one of the early settlers in the Upper Squamish. Uh, the family up there often took uh, uh, tourists or uh, visitors to the valley uh, fishing in the Eluhu and uh, the Upper Squamish area. This is a picture of him logging with a team of horses. The early logging in the valley was done by the pioneer settlers who were clearing land for their farms. Oxen were quite often used down in the Brackendale area and skid roads were made, that is laying logs um, side by side so that the logs would roll easily um, behind the horses and oxen. And the lumber was used basically for building the homes and barns and outbuildings. Hauling logs out of the forest, even with the help of steam donkeys, was a slow process until the arrival of the railway.
In 1912, the Pacific Great Eastern Railway began construction of a railway from Squamish to Pemberton, which was completed a year later. To attract investors, they started calling the downtown area of Squamish Newport. Few people liked the new handle, and by 1914 it had reverted back to Squamish, derived from Skomish, a name the Squamish First Nations had given the area. During this early period, transportation by horse and buggy was gradually being replaced by the automobile, and cars were becoming very popular in the Squamish Valley. When the newfangled cars came into production, my grandfather could not resist getting one. Not just one, but one for the valley. He started a uh, stage service from the docks up to Chikai, and uh, he often had people come out from eastern uh, Canada and the eastern United States delivering uh, parts or bringing a new car out for him. He added a garage to the ranch, to the farm, and uh, had it all set up so that he could do all his own repairs. He uh, spent a lot of time there, much to my grandmother's distress, because when he wasn't doing that, he wasn't filling the wood box or uh, helping with repairs around the house. My grandfather, anything that was new, he wanted to have, even though he was isolated up here in Squamish. Uh, if he heard about it, whether it was um, the new radios or uh, telephones or uh, whether it was things that were going on around the world that he wanted to know about, the revolutions and the um, revolts and, and so on, the emerging countries, he was really keen on. And if there was anyone that came into the valley who was new and had been someplace in the world, he was always inviting them in for supper and, and sort of picking their brains and getting into debates with them. He was a keen reader, and we probably had one of the, the best libraries in the valley. Of course, there was no public library at the time. So in the front room, he had um, a floor-to-ceiling bookcase. <laughs> Something's my sweet, I think a beneath to be an octopus. Something's my sweet, I think a beneath to be an octopus. With more arms to hold you, and more hearts to love you, and more, more arms to hold you, and more them hearts to love.
password I think it'd be made to Be an octopus Something's my sweet I think it'd be made to Be an octopus The kitchen in the jug Judd House, like most uh, pioneer people, was the center of the family and of uh, the activities. And my grandmother was an exceptional cook. She uh, specialized, of course, in the meat and potatoes part of it, but she was also very good at the pies and the cakes and cookies. She churned her own uh, butter and uh, made cottage cheese and head cheese and she, all the specialty items and of course she was making it for a very very large family along with um, the neighbors and the uh, farm hands so it was a major production Mark Armstrong is the grandson of Minnie Ray Armstrong he still has fond memories of the days he spent with his grandmother and the story she told him about the Ray family. His great-grandmother was Kate Ray, who was widowed after her husband was killed in a tragic accident. This picture is of the Ray family about a year after Alan Ray was killed, so it was a terrible, terrible tragedy. He was clearing the land. Uh, he'd set a charge he was going to blow a stump out, and um, it was a drizzly day, which wasn't a good day to be doing that sort of thing because sometimes if the fuse gets damp uh, it'll go out or it could be just burning very slowly. He waited and waited and waited for it to go off. Uncle Whiff was with him. He stayed home from school to help his dad work in clearing the land. Finally uh, Alan Ray had waited so long he thought it must have gone out. The fuse must have gone out. So he said uh, to Wilford, you stay here, I'm going to go up and, and, and you know, check it out. He, w he went up there just as he got to the stump. The thing blew up, and he was, you know, just thrown through the air. Uncle Whiff saw the whole thing, and uh, he told me of it as an old man. He told me the story. So now Kate Whit Ray was, was a widow with ten children. You can see the youngest is about two or three here. The year was 1904 when this happened. Um, a lot of the boys, well, they, they worked on the farm, and she did have the ranch, and I guess, you know, it was a living, and she took in boarders, uh, and she uh, bought this boarding house, and so that's where they lived for the next few years. Called it the halfway house, because a lot of people lived up in the upper valley then, but people would stay here at this boarding house. So Kate Ray borrowed a hundred dollars from Mr. Masheter and managed to get some money. They had one horse and buggy. There's a picture of it here. Here it is. With uh, Kate Ray driving the horse and buggy. Anyway, these all, these boys would say uh, they'd all be around the table. They'd say having dinner. Who wants to use the buggy tonight? Maybe they wanted to take a girlfriend out or something, and they'd all go. Or, no, we we don't want to, because whoever asked first, he'd be the one that would get the horse and buggy. And Nana said they they were always so, you know, she just thought they were a beautiful, a wonderful family. actually the second Brackendale School. The first Brackendale School was down closer to the Mamquin Bridge. It was built uh, for the entire valley and uh, the students uh, actually rode horseback to it because most of the uh, population was up near the Brackendale store or down near the Squamish uh, community where the stores were. There were only a few students 
and eventually the Squamish students decided that it was too far to come and so they um, had a school in one of the houses down in that area. The Brackendale students continued to go to that school for a short time but even at that the distance was so great and the wild animals and such terrified the mothers in the area and so they asked that their a school be built closer to the settlement. This, this is the second school. It was at Lesky's Crossing and uh, lasted for quite a few years. Uh, the problem was that during flood times this area was flooded and it got uh, so bad during one flood that it was almost impossible to dry it out properly. It was affecting the health of the children and so they thought that they would build another school up near Government and Judd Road. In fact, they were in the process of uh, getting this property. When it was decided that um, perhaps they could move the students down to the Masterty School, which had been built down in Squamish and had it had, was four rooms and two of them were just being used. It was uh, underused. So uh, an agreement was made between the Brackendale School District and the Squamish School District to move the students down there. Willie was my mother's older brother. There were only two boys in the family and eight girls. He was perhaps the uh, the one most liked by the, the rest of the family. He was a quite a big sport and uh, was very good at riding horses and uh, things of this nature. And along with his older brother Earl, they went to war during the, the uh, First World War. My grandfather managed to get them home for the harvest and uh, they went back to the European battlefields. Both of them survived and uh, it was with great glee that they were welcomed back home again. Unfortunately, Willie came down with the flu, the Spanish flu, and uh, died at home in one of the beds. Annie my grandmother also had the flu at that time. My grandmother managed to survive. After the fire, which was caused by an article of clothing smoldering behind a stove, the Judd homestead was reconstructed. It featured the rescued piano from the old house and a billiard table. It quickly became a hangout for local males intent on wooing the eight Judd girls. The Judd home was a center for entertainment, dancing and games, lasting well into the wee hours of the morning. When he figured it was time for the guests to leave, Harry Judd took up the fiddle and played Good Night Ladies to signal an end to the evening's festivities. I remember as a very young child being taken by my grandma Armstrong up to the old Judd house, which is still there now, up on Judd Road. and. Uh, I think it must have been when the old, when Mr. Judd died, because he died in 1952, and I would have been four then. And I think probably my grandmother took, went out to visit them, probably. And uh, so I remember being in this great big house, and, you know, I can remember all the dark wood and everything.
Floods were a constant menace in Brackendale. Harry Judd was a surveyor and built his house above the floodplain, so he figured there was little chance of the water entering the house until the flood of 1940. My grandmother had just had new linoleum put throughout the lower part of the uh, house, and the flood waters rose, and they watched it come in the basement up one step and then another step, and at the height of the flood, it came in about a quarter of an inch over all the nice floors. My grandfather never lived that down. My grandmother 
uh, was so disturbed about having to clean the silt out of the house. It took years to get it out from underneath that new linoleum. And I remember even when we moved into the house in uh, about 1958, um, there was still silt that would come up when my mother at that time used the vacuum cleaner. This is a picture of my grandparents, probably um, about the time of their 55th anniversary. They, uh, there was no such a thing as retirement for a farmer. They did take an uh, extended holiday down to California where a couple of their girls, Edith and Ruth, had uh, moved. But uh, for the most part, they did not take holidays. They were home people. And my grandfather worked right up until about oh, two months before he died. Both my grandparents were very keen on municipal and uh, community events. Uh, my grandfather was one of the founding members of the Farmers Institute when it was first formed and was very keen on such things as uh, bringing in uh, seeds, uh, loads of hay, uh, uh, bringing in uh, veterinarians and people who could talk about uh, various things concerning farming and uh, crop rotation and so on. My grandmother was a, a founding member of the Women's Institute and in this picture she is being honored at one of the Christmas parties. On her left is my her oldest daughter, my Aunt Olive, and directly behind her is her only daughter-in-law, uh, Gwyneth Judd, who was actually a teacher um, in the valley. from the outside is a no dilettante of nose to her split by season storm. Northern reports fourth in the early going, then Red Raffles, uh, Brigadier Brooks, a money trail, and a trailing is long shot break even. And they head toward the far turn, Calendar Boy and McElhaney. They widen now to a length and a half. Season storm is in behind in second, no dilettante third. Northern report is fourth and five and a half lengths off the lead. Then Red Raffles, money trail to the inside. Local Brackendale entrepreneur and former Air Force pilot, Ron Banner, started reaching for the sky while he was still in diapers back in the 1920s. Like Harry Judd, his story is one of determination and the will to make dreams come true. 
Ron and his wife Isabel raised four children and started a shuttle bus service to Whistler and flew tourists and skiers to glaciers in the Squamish area. Yeah, that came in from Switzerland, yeah. yeah. I was taking a generator up to uh, Lord River, to the mine, up in Lord River. And uh, the engine started to overheat. And I got up around 8,000 feet. And I wanted another 2,000 feet, and I couldn't get it because it didn't have the power. And finally, I had to put it into the bush. It, the engine caught fire, and... Uh, and it, it, it was just going to quit. I told the guy beside me, he says, you scared? He says, no, hell no. <laughs> I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> so then, uh, I forget his name. I got it in my logbook. And then I said, well, uh, we're going to have to put this thing in and we're not going to get up, get the airstrip up at Lower River. Mind you, no matter for an airstrip anyway, we landed in the creek. So I, I, while I still had some control, I put it in that, I landed right in that bush right there where you see that. Yeah, well, there's a good, there's a good picture. It's a pretty, pretty country up there. See that big waterfall and everything. We had to climb over that, climb up that waterfall, around the side of it, to get back to get into the mine. It took about two days to walk out. Tommy Ollie, what was it? Uh, what, what was his airplane that he had? He had a Wilga. A Wilga. A Wilga right. from Poland. On skis. On skis, yeah. And he used to go up to the glaciers and yeah. paint. Yeah, right. He'd sit there all day. And we'd bring passengers up to him, and he'd sit there like God and say, What can I do for the peasants? <laughs> uh, we lived in Nanaimo for about 20 years before we came over to Brackendale. Uh, Ron was uh, a pilot at that time. He used to fly many different places in... Uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Whitehorse. He flew in all those places. And all the time that he was flying, he was thinking to himself, well, you know, I would really like to get my own business. The first idea that he came up with was that he was going to fly skiers from, uh, from Vancouver Island, from Nanaimo, to, to Whistler. But uh, as time went on, he found out that, uh, guess what? Uh, Whistler would not allow him to land over there. He thought, well, if I have a ski plane, I could land up on top of the mountain, which was what he really would have liked to do. But uh, at that time, they decided, no, they weren't going to let allow that. And uh, so then he decided maybe he'll go to Pemberton and do that. But, of course, Pemberton was too far away. And so eventually he decided, well, maybe it could be Squamish because Squamish is not that far away from Whistler and there's a good road there, there's an airport there, so why not go to Squamish? So that's how, that's how we got to Squamish and uh, got to building a house in Brackendale. Vic Herford and his wife Myrtle share a lot of memories after living in the Squamish Valley for over 60 years. Vic was a logging contractor and heavy equipment operator, and Myrtle was the first operator at the Squamish Telephone Exchange Office. The office uh, opened in September 28, 1950, and uh, we were so glad to get the new headsets. We were the only ones in, uh, out of the Vancouver uh, Long Distance Office that had these new headsets. People in town were pleased that they could get a phone before there was no room for them to have a phone. When it got really busy, you just went on automatic, and these uh, th things here you pl plugged into the number, and then uh, your hands just went, and they crossed one another. And then the government telephone and telegraph uh, had the um, the office. Uh, there was uh, when we uh, they closed out. I think there was uh, 
50, 54 found phones in the whole valley, including um, Tikai. Some of the people that had businesses had uh, went from a, a party line to a, 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 just their own line, private line. And then, of course, the office grew and grew till there was um, uh, about six or seven of these switchboards uh, all, all along this way. And uh, there'd be anywhere from uh, four to five girls on at a time. And uh, then, But when it first opened like this, there was only one switchboard, so one girl on at a time. I started in the forest industry in uh, 1942, February 1942. The reason I started to work in the forest industry, I had quit school when I was 15, and my dad decided that I would do better if I went to live with my brother, which lived in Camel River, which he was employed in the forest industry, and he got me started in the forest industry, learning how to punk whistles. That was usually the first job in the woods those days. I did that for about two weeks without pay, and finally the company decided that maybe they'd give me a chance at getting a paid job. And I think my rate of pay at that time was um, $5.40 a day. I lived in camp, and uh, room and board was really good, it was $1.25 a day, and they had a Chinese laundry, and they did all their laundry for 25 cents a week. So it was pretty good living. I uh, worked there at that camp in Campbell River for about a year. And then <clears throat> I went into the fishing industry. And I worked in the fishing industry for another two to three years. Then I went back into the forest industry up the coast, probably around 1944, 45. I know I was up there when the war ended. Actually, uh, when I finished logging up the coast, I came to Vancouver, and uh, those days everybody worked in the forest industry, and we usually went from camp to camp in lots of cases. In my case at that time, I found there was, uh, they needed an operator for a piece of equipment up here in Squamish. And uh, so I decided that wasn't very far out of Vancouver, so I'd come up here. This is the... Uh, New style arch, I was driving it uh, in 1955. We haven't actually used it yet, but they're kind of a nice machine to run. And uh, there's the old arch that we used to use behind a small tractor. It just goes to show you how far ahead we've come. And uh, we, um, I don't know what we're gonna do with that old arch. I guess we're gonna put it someplace for a museum Uh, that's uh, across the river from Brackendale. Uh, matter of fact, you can still see some of the logging slash for that was, if you look closely, it's, it's easy to see because you've got so much new growth. Now, that chunk line you see go up and down, there's a line that's below it, and uh, it's a safety line, so if somebody's standing underneath it, the cable will touch them first, and they'll get out of the way. Now that's the spar tree, and they have a yarder that'll be yarding the logs. Actually, it was about a three-mile haul. It wasn't a very long haul, but fairly steep. Everything had to be taken across the river by log float. All the equipment. There he goes down the hill. He's got a pretty good load of wood there, probably in the neighborhood of 10,000 board feet. Here's in the same area, and they're loading logs, and they're uh, using a uh, tongs and uh, a heel boom. And they swing it around to pick up the logs, and this is the donkey. It's got a Ford V8 engine on it. Actually, it's a Murdy donkey, Murdy 60 is the model. Now you can see it how it picks up the log and heals it, and then it sets it down. Now above the donkey you'll see a chunk of wood going up and down there. That's the chunk line. That there pulls the boom around one direction, and they 
pull it the other way with power, but they only got uh, two drums on the machine, so they have to use a chunk line in order to be able to get the boom back again. This here picture is a picture of a unit crane on a small steel barge, and we're picking logs off the bottom and putting them into a special barge. And uh, this barge, when it's loaded with sunken deadhead, we put uh, three floating logs on top of them and lash them together, and then we're able to uh, float the whole works out, and we're able to uh, take the deadheads down to a mill, and they can lift the whole bundle out and uh, reclaim the logs. This other picture is a picture of the divers involved. They have to go down and set the chokers on the logs and bring them up. And this was about 1970, both these pictures were taken. On our honeymoon, we went down to Seattle, and of course we'd heard about television, but we'd never really seen one. And we got this hotel room, and by gosh, they had a TV in there. So we decided, well, we'll watch this thing for a while. Yeah, well, you can hardly see it. But anyway, it was all about the Count of Monte Cristo, and we stayed up all night watching TV on our honeymoon. <laughs> Tamara Stanners is a well-known television personality who has been involved with various media productions. She and her husband Lauren are raising their children in the former Judd House, which they are in the process of painstakingly renovating. The old homestead continues to be used as a set for film and TV productions, including most recently the Men in Trees series. Lauren has always renovated historic homes. That's sort of his specialty. And I got this phone call from him one day and he was just like, honey, I found the place. I found it. It's amazing. It's just this beautiful yellow house. It's in this great big yard. And I have to say it was a mixed blessing at that time as the house was in huge disrepair. So we lived here with no heat and uh, very little hot water for, it was really two years probably that we did that in this crazy dilapidated kitchen that was, I mean, the place was really falling apart. But Lorne worked his magic on it and uh, put it back to really what it was more like when it was originally built. You know, getting rid of the shag carpeting and um, the plywood and, and, and putting it back to its roots. And it's funny because Ellen Grant had a hard time initially coming into the house because she was so emotional about it. It had so many memories for her. And when she came in and saw what Lorne had done, she started to cry. She was so moved by the fact that he took it back to what her grandparents had had and it was important for her.
Thor Froslow, who recently celebrated his 75th birthday, is the proprietor of the Brackendale Art Gallery. He has provided a forum for music and the arts for the past 25 years and has been instrumental in the development of the Brackendale Eagles Provincial Park. He also organizes the annual Brackendale Eagle Count. The renowned Brackendale Art Gallery, or BAG as it's known, has become a meeting place for locals and visitors alike and provides shelter and rehabilitation for injured eagles and other birds.
of a clear burning stream I sat down on a bed of primrose dew And quickly fell into a dream I dreamed I beheld a fair maiden Her equals I'd never seen before As she stride for the walls of her country As she strolled along Erin's green shore Her cheeks were like two blooming roses And her teeth were like ivory so white And her eyes were like two sparkling diamonds Or the stars on a clear frosty night She resembled the goddess of liberty And freedom was the mantle she wore Bound round with the shamrock and roses That grew along Erin's green shore I quickly addressed this fair damsel My jewel come, tell me your name I know in this place you're a stranger Or never would have asked you the same I know you're a true son of Aaron My secrets to you are unfold I'm here in the midst of all danger Not knowing my friend or my I'm the daughter of Daniel O'Connor From England I've lately sailed over I came here to awaken my brother Who's slumbering on every Transported with joy, I awakened And found it was only a dream For to see this fair damsel beside me I long for the slumber again May the heavens above be her guardian I know I won't see her no more May the sunbeams of glory shine on her As she sails along Erin's green shore I know I won't see her no